Hi everyone. Today we're going to talk about Silver and the Short, J.P. Morgan behind the scenes. Because a couple of weeks ago, people had asked me questions about what was going on with J.P. Morgan's silver position. And you know, I don't like to give you any uneducated answers. So I jumped into this rabbit hole for you. My name is Lynette Zhang and welcome to ITM Trading. Hello, today again we're going to talk about silver and the short, J.P. Morgan behind the scenes. And we're going to start with why J.P. Morgan would have been accumulating silver to begin with. And that takes us back to the previous crisis in 2008 when the Federal Reserve helped them buy Bear Stearns who had the largest short silver position. Now understand, selling something short means that you're selling something that you do not own. And a key in this piece is that you have unlimited losses to it. There are those that think that that, uh, that a spike in silver spot was what actually toppled Bear Stearns. I can't prove that one way or another, but frankly, it does make a lot of sense. And, you know, anybody that was around then saw Bear Stearns go from about 160 bucks to two bucks. But what that also means is that JP Morgan inherited that position. And whether that was what caused the demise of Bear Stearns or other factors or a combination of factors that caused the demise, what JP Morgan knew and knows is that they had a very, very dangerous situation that they had to address or it would threaten their viability. And since they are one of, and arguably, uh, the largest banks on the planet and completely connected to all other banks, that would be a very serious occurrence. And this is something we're going to come back to toward the end of this. But the interesting thing about uh, J.P. Morgan's silver position is since they started to accumulate silver, they have never had a trading loss, not even once. That's amazing. And it defies normal markets. Again, you know, I'm not privy to any kind of agreements or what have you, but it is certainly a possibility, as some think, that when they made the agreement to buy Bear Stearns, being well aware of the financial position that they were in and in particular even their short silver position that they could have come up with some kind of arrangement because what they've been allowed to do is control both markets the physical silver market as well as the paper silver market so we're going to start with the physical silver market on in april 2011 they had zero ounces of silver now they bought bear in 2008 and they started to reduce those silver short positions. But that's not something you can do real easily. So it made a lot of sense to start to accumulate physical silver to offset those shorts. But, and, and keep in mind too, that it's not just that, that uh, JP Morgan only holds physical silver. They also hold physical gold. And while they definitely do have a much larger per ounce size in their silver position, this is not a small position. One point, what, hundred thousands, millions, 1.6 million ounces of gold is not chump change either. So, but everything has a different function, which we're going to talk about as we move through this. Because a lot of people wonder, well, with all of this physical demand, here you go. And this is just JP Morgan. There's more of it. How could the spot price go down? Well, if you also control the paper market, you can do it. 
And you know, they've been working on dematerializing. In other words, converting something that's tangible and physical into intangibles. They've been working on that heavily since the 70s. And they finally did it, well, they did it with gold and silver in the spot market and the derivative markets. But in 2004-ish and there, they created the ETFs, GLD for gold and SLV for silver. So that if people are buying into that market, they think they're buying gold and silver, what they're actually buying is a contract. So it's a really brilliant way to get people to pay when all they're really participating is the price action that is pretty easily controlled because underneath all of that, JP Morgan can take possession of the physical metal. You and I, if we own GLD and SLV, we just own a contract. We cannot take possession of the underlying physical metal. And keep in mind, whoever holds it, owns it. That's the bottom line. So just as a little reminder for some of you that might be sitting on, on SLV and GLD, in the beginning when they first came out with these products, which is what they are, they waived a lot of fees and it was designed to get you to think that they moved exactly with the spot market. And they did. They didn't charge some fees. But after a while, that was only temporary and it says it right in the prospectus. Anybody can go read them. So you can see the divergence between this blue line, which is their net asset value, and the red line, which is the spot market. And you can see how it's grown over time, and it will. So in there, it's a beautiful way for JP Morgan to still control all of that physical metal, both the silver and the gold, and get paid to do so while they really have access to all of the physical and you don't. I mean, it really is a genius thing. But just keep in mind, if you don't hold it, you don't own it. So this is kind of the crossover between the purely physical world, which still controlled by Wall Street in this case, and the purely intangible or digital world. And that's what we're going to look at next. Excuse me. Colds are very annoying, but <clears throat> what you're looking at here, and, and this is just one, all of these things, they're just a small piece uh, of uh, and places where they can make bets against silver and gold, which is what we're looking at now, or where they can hold it. JP Morgan has vaults all over the world. So understand, all of this is just a small piece, and it's also pretty opaque. So to uh, get... All of the data? I don't think so. It's just not possible. Um, even I went into the OCC report. We'll look at that in a little bit. But I went into the OCC report and something that I found really interesting just as an analyst. Since 2008 in the crisis, they uh, are presumably, it, it creates other stuff. And I'll do a, a YouTube video on that. But presumably they're trying to move the derivative trades on to exchanges, uh, central counterparty exchanges. Well, they've made a bit of headway in all areas, but interestingly enough, and particularly with JP Morgan, they have zero of those derivatives, which is what we're looking at here, zero of those derivative trades regarding precious metals, both gold and silver, are done through an exchange. 100% of them, according to the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, are done OTC, which means that we cannot see what that agreement is because that is simply an agreement between buy or try, so between either two entities or three entities, whatever that agreement is. So understand, this is an extraordinarily opaque um, segment, but... 
I'd like to point out that the end users, because originally derivatives, futures contracts, those kinds of things, had a valid uh, point. And for some, the end user, they do. If I'm a farmer and I'm going to ship wheat in September and it's January, I have no idea what my growing season is going to be. I have no idea what the price for my wheat is going to be in September when I need to harvest it. So in that way, it is definitely a hedge. But, of course, Wall Street takes it to the next level and turns it into a speculation. And so for 27 users, teeny weeny weeny, you have 40 speculators just in this one area at the CME. And those traders have sold, two of the top eight, have sold 200 days, 200 days of silver production and 98 days of of gold production. And here's my thing about that. What we need to understand is the value that we bring to the table, the value of our labor. It takes physical labor and I don't know how many people and how much energy and how much equipment and how much of a commitment to produce those 98 days of gold and those 200 days of silver. <coughs> And yet, with a push of a button, Wall Street reduces the value of all of that labor and all of that energy. And it's purely for profits. If you can sell something that doesn't exist and control a market and then turn around on the other side of it and buy it after you've put, pushed that price down to ridiculously cheap levels... I mean, I'm going to let you draw your own conclusion on that. But what we're really seeing here is that they're controlling both sides of this market. But they also own both of the metals. And that is diversification. Now, what do they know that maybe you're not quite so clear on, although we talk about it here all of the time? Well, first of all, they absolutely know that gold is money and everything else is credit. Well, I'd say gold and silver is money and everything else is credit. And this is the level of credit that has been grown. This was from last year, okay, because I follow JP Morgan and we already had talked about the credit bubble pattern shift that occurred. This is one year. Look at this spike. So when you hear all of the talking heads on CNBC and the Wall Street Journal and Bloomberg and all these places, they're telling you how robust the economies are. The global economy is going to be okay. Okay, maybe the trade war is making things a little iffy, but things are going great. Well, ask yourself this. If you have enough wealth to buy what you need, so you go to the grocery store, do you still use a credit card and not pay it off? You know, you might not be able to pay it off if things aren't going so well. And look at this. This is the global credit card. And this is really key because we know that since the crisis that happened here, that the markets, and particularly in the deepest, most liquid market in the world, the U.S. Treasury market, at least that's what we're told, still, according to J.P. Morgan, these things come out of their own reports, the liquidity, the ability to sell and not have a massive impact on price is down two-thirds. And the same thing is true in the stock market, except it gets even worse with the rise of passive investments. Because those are all guided by algorithms, computers, not people. And so when something's triggered, it triggers something else. Plus, since ETFs have to rebalance at the very end of the day, that's where all of that liquidity has been pulled to. I'll do something on that because we really need to understand it. But that means that if anybody wants to sell a large block of anything prior to the end of the day, they're going to create havoc in the markets, the flash crashes. And that's exactly what the J.P. Morgan um, analysts are talking about. Flash crashes and social unrest.
That's what they see. Could that be why they're accumulating all of that physical gold and the silver? Because actually, if they needed to balance out their civil, civ, um, excuse me, their silver short positions, sometimes that's a little challenging to say. But in order to balance out their current silver short positions that I could see, and based upon the COT report, which dictates the amount of physical, at least that they have in this one area, there are about 50 million ounces of silver short of being able to cover what I can see. And I have no idea what's going on with what I don't see. But they do, and they're talking about it right here. And the other piece that I want to show you is from the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. Mm, here it comes. Because I think that a big part of why they did it, yeah, they had to protect themselves on that short position. That's huge. But they also know that metals are the appropriate diversifier. If everything you have is intangible, when the system shuts down for any reason, reason at all, you lose all access. It doesn't do very good. So I'm thinking that they looked into their wonderful crystal balls. And, and this wonderful person sent me this today. It's, it's great. I'll talk about it more in just a second. But they looked into their crystal balls and they know darn well that these are the speculative derivatives and, and we know we've talked about it. There's all sorts of netting tools that enable this to look smaller and look at the spike that we're back up to. This is from the uh, second quarter. So this is the most current one that they've published and this does not look real pretty, especially when most of them are speculation. Here's the end users. So these are all just big unsubstantiated bets and of that, 28% of them are J.P. Morgan. 28%. That's got to make you pause. They know it. I think that's why they're accumulating both gold and silver. And truthfully, when you look at what they're doing for their stock, okay, I just pulled this this morning on the NASDAQ. You can go in and see what the J.P. Morgan insiders, this guy's at sits that sit on the board of directors, um, the CEO, the CFO, all the guys at the very top, they're selling out in a very big way. This, this orange, that's the last month, 12, uh, 12 months selling, and then this one. And maybe it's because the FSB, the Financial Stability Board, tells you right here that JP Morgan is the most dangerous of all the globally systemic important banks all the G-SIBs, they are completely inter, intermingled. I'm sorry, they are incestuously intertwined. I don't want to really offend anybody, but that's the best way to say it. So if JP Morgan goes down, well, guess what? So does everybody else. If Deutsche Bank goes down, and this was a shocker to me, the fact that Deutsche Bank is classified by the Financial Stability Board as a bit less uh, dangerous than J.P. Morgan? Think about that one. Because we know they are a zombie bank. They're all zombie banks. That's really the truth. That's why they're holding the physical metal. That's why you should be holding the physical metal. We all should be. Because it can last longer than you would imagine. But this does not last forever. And... Even just going back, I'm going to go back to this one just for a moment more. Look at this pattern shift. This was liftoff. Then when we had that first derivative explosion, can you see how that's, the pattern shifted and it, it drew, went up much faster? But you barely had any pullbacks until we hit the second derivative crisis. And then... You've been choppy ever since. And with all of this new money that they pushed into the system to cover up the real death of the system that had in 2008, this is what they're telling you. Everything is so robust and everything is growing. What's growing? It's the debt. It's the credit. When is this going to implode? When they can't do this anymore. When they can't extend any more credit because people can't pay it back. Nobody can pay it back. And I showed you last week how the consumers, similar patterns, I mean, everybody's a similar pattern. But if the consumer stops spending 
And, you know, I mean, you got to have the banana, but you don't have to have the blouse. When the consumer stops spending, it's game over because it's almost 70% of the gross domestic product with government spending pretty much the balance of it. Keep this in mind. So that's what's happening in that regard. And I really would like to thank Chris Bradley because, um, Chris, thank you so much. You don't even know. I do love this. Crystal ball. And uh, it says that it will be very happy on my desk. But my sister, Norma, um, who's no longer with us, her thing was elephants. So as soon as I opened it up, I said, thank you. Because now it's like I have my sister with me all the time. I really appreciate it. And the other thing that he sent that I really, really love is this Avenger shield. Because I sure am doing my best to bring value to the table and protect us. And guess what this shield is made of? It's made of silver. It's made of metal. Because we know shields are made of metal, not promises not paper. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. That's really, and I, and I, if you look at me like an Avenger, I don't know that I've really earned that, but I'm doing my best. I promise. So, uh, today, actually in a few minutes, I'm going to be doing an interview with Sean at SGT. And I always love those, you know, we always have a good time. And then next week in a coffee with Lynette, will be with Liar Gans because I think it's important to know what the different generations are doing, where everybody's at, and you know, um, no offense to anybody, but he is my favorite little millennial. Or Gen Xer. He's a Gen Xer. So uh, I hope that you found benefit in this. You can see that they're accumulating physical metals, and you also know that I think you should do what the smartest guys in the room are doing for themselves. So if you're wondering, well, gee, then maybe I should buy all of this silver? Well, they've got a short position to cover. But the answer is yes, you should have silver and you should have gold. And that's what the strategy that I developed just based on studying currencies since 87 and all of those repeatable patterns. But you don't want to just throw a dart. Well, you can. You can do anything you want because both of them are severely undervalued. However, I think it makes a whole lot more sense to develop a strategy. What am I trying? And that starts with your goals. What do I need to accomplish? And then using those different monetary metals, both silver and gold, to support your personal goals. That's what we do here. If we can be of service, you know, call us. And then until tomorrow, please be safe. And again, shields are made of metal, not promises or paper. Bye-bye.